Chapter 16 of The Secret of the Ninth Planet, Version 2 by Donald Walheim. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter 16 In Orbit Around Pluto. There was a mad rush to action stations. Detmar, Ferrati, and Oberfield, who had been in their bunks, dashed to their posts while others tried to pass them in both directions. Haines and Burl hastily climbed into their spacesuits while Ferrati and Bolton manned the inner defensive controls. Burl pulled the tight-fitting harness of his insulated spacesuit over him. The shape of the sun-tapper ship came into focus on the tiny screen of the airlock viewer. It was approaching them at a frighteningly rapid pace. He could see the broken framework of one of its two globes, the one on which they had scored their hit. The other globe and the connecting passages were strikingly clear. Tiny circles of windows were visible in the passage section, which undoubtedly housed the operators of the vessel. For a fleeting instant he realized that, as yet, none of the earthlings had any inkling of what these creatures looked like. While he knew that the scene was telescopic, the ship was undoubtedly approaching them fast or rather, they were catching up to it at a perilous pace. Whether the wrecked enemy had slowed down more than they had as it approached its Plutonian base, or whether some other surprise lay ahead, they had no idea. Burl felt a jarring impact as Lockhart cut the Magellan's drive. There was an instant of weightlessness, and then their weight reversed as the A.G. drive strove to slow down the ship. Within the airlock they were outside the living space of the sphere, suspended beneath the drive chamber. Burl could see the walls of the inner sphere whirl past him a foot away as the living quarters rotated to shift with the gravitational change. And at that very moment, while all those inside were temporarily helpless, disaster struck. Burl had just finished adjusting his airtight helmet, and Haines was already on his way forward to the outer shell port and the rocket guns, when there was a flash of lightning from the crippled enemy spaceship. The foe was still capable of fighting, and it had fired first, alarmingly close. Within what seemed a split second after Burl's eyes had registered the flash on the little viewplate, the Magellan received the full force of the mighty electronic discharge. To Burl it seemed as if a thunderclap had sounded in his ears, and as if he had been plunged into a bath of white flames. The walls of the passage sparked brilliantly, blinding light filled the air, and Burl's body vibrated as it would to an electric shock. He reeled wildly, catching at the walls and almost falling. In a few senses his senses recovered, although his body was still humming from the blow, and his ears were ringing. The viewplate had gone black, the lights in the airlock corridor were dark, and when he tried to gain his feet he realized that the ship now had no gravity. It was falling free without power. Haines was slumped in the end of the corridor with the port nearly opened. Burl pushed his way over to him and helped the groggy explorer to his feet. There was no sound, and Burl suddenly remembered that he hadn't taken the time to switch on his helmet phone. He did so and was relieved to hear Haines' voice asking if he was all right. I'm okay, Burl called. Let's get this port open. Maybe we can hit back at least once. Together they turned the bolts and pushed the thick outer shell door open. Without the aid of telescopic sights, they could see the shape of the sun-tapper vessel plainly, outlined against the curtain of distant stars. Struggling not to think of what might be going on within the Magellan, their earphones registered nothing except each other, they unlimbered the long tube of the rocket launcher and aimed point-blank at the foe. Haines reached into the ammunition locker vault alongside the passageway and selected the biggest and wickedest of the available shells. He twisted the dial in the warhead and, while Burl held the aim, shoved in the rocket shell. With a press of the button the missile roared out of the tube, racing in an arc of fire directly toward the faint vision of the other ship. They watched with bated breath counting the seconds, hoping not to see another blast of electrical fire but apparently the foe had exhausted its limited resources, for the thin spidery line of rocket sparks reached out farther and farther until it seemed to touch the surface of the golden globe. There was a great flare in the sky now, an outpouring of fire and hot metal. When it cleared away, the sky was empty. Haines wearily drew the outer port shut. 
Now, let's see if we're goners too, he said quietly. They sealed the outer shell and made their way along the dark passage. Even as they were unlocking the toggles of the inner hatch, the corridor lights started to flicker. They would light up dimly and then flicker out, light up again, flare for an instant, then die down. Someone was alive within the ship. They got the hatch open. In the central section of the living sphere, the lights were also dim, and in a few places they were completely out. They emerged and closed the hatch behind them. Only after Haynes had tested the inner atmosphere and found it still pressurized did they open their helmets and climb stiffly out of the spacesuits, wincing at bruises they had sustained but had not noticed until then. The air pressure was all right but there was a smell of burned rubber and insulation in the air. Now that their helmets were off, they could hear voices somewhere above. They found Oberfield lying unconscious, thrown to the floor by the sudden shift of the ship. They climbed into the control room. Lockhart was floating in the air near the open hatchway leading to the engine room overhead. He was calling out orders to someone who was within. Russ was working over the navigation desk, a bandage around his head, trying to figure out where they would be and where they were heading without having access to the still dark viewplates. Lockhart twisted in the weightless air when he saw them. He seemed both relieved and distressed. I'm glad you're okay, but I had hoped you'd be able to put in a blow for us. Burl realized that inside the ship they had no way of knowing that vengeance had been served. Hastily he explained. His words cheered everyone. Russ and Lockhart shouted joyously. Detmar poked his head down the hatch and called the news back to his two fellows who were struggling to get the AG generators functioning. The bolt of energy, whatever it may have been designed to do to a ship of the Sun Tapper build, did not have the totally disastrous effect on the Magellan that it was intended to have. It had knocked out their electrical system temporarily, burned out some of its parts, and caused the AG system to fail, although the atomic piles were impervious to such currents. Oberfield, Ferrati, and Shea were badly hurt. There now followed an anxious period during which more and more of the electrical system began to function as the men labored to rig up emergency wires and to replace burned-out bulbs and lines. There was a general cheer when the viewplates flickered into life again, though not all functioned. They again had access to the sky about them, even though not all sectors were covered. The humming in the engine room started up, rose and fell uneasily a couple of times, and then they felt a surge of force. Lockhart fell gently to the floor as the ship began to drive ahead, and then in a few minutes the AG drive was back on, and the Magellan was again under control. We took what they had to give, and it wasn't enough, exulted Haynes. Now wait till we reach their main works. We'll show them. Lockhart shook his head wearily as he and Russ worked over the controls. Let's hope we don't have to show them soon. Our ship is running on emergency rigging. Caton says he's going to have to rest the ship and rewire a good part of the system. Meanwhile, we will be able to reach Pluto safely enough. Pluto was visible in the forward viewplates. They could see lighter and darker patches on it, almost like the markings of continents and oceans, but there was no evidence of an atmosphere, nor had they expected any. Reading showed that the average surface temperature was about 200 degrees Fahrenheit below zero, even lower in many places. They searched the surface for signs of their foe. They found what they wanted on the North Polar Depression, a basin in the oblate sphere of Bluto. There was no ring station. There rose a vast pile of dark masonry, a mighty structure covering at least a square mile, a fortress building whose roofs bristled with an array of masts and reflectors and hanging on patrol over this polar basin were two more of the dumbbell ships. "'We're in no position to come to grips with them,' said Lockhart. "'I'm going to take the Magellan into a low orbit around Pluto's equator. We'll be out of their sight, yet near enough to do some probing and exploring while we're making repairs.' This they proceeded to do, swinging the ship down to within a few hundred miles of the Plutonian surface, setting on a fixed orbit around the equator exactly as the Sputniks of years past had first circled the bulk of the earth. Staying far enough up to maintain orbit, they were close enough to be below the planet's radiation belt. 
taking stock of the ship's condition showed that they dearly needed this delay. Repairs would not be completed for several days. Practically everyone had been bruised or shaken up. Oberfield had a fractured skull and was in serious condition. Ferrati had broken his leg and pelvis. Shea had a couple of cracked ribs. The men were given emergency medical treatment and confined to quarters. The Magellan quietly circled Pluto once every hour and a half, and the ship tried to resume its normal life. Russ studied the surface beneath them, Haynes and Burl at his elbow. Then, after conferring, the three approached Lockhart. We want permission to make a landing, Russ said. If we take the four-man rocket plane, we can make the ground safely. We've got to reconnoiter before we can figure out how to put this master sun-tap station out of business. Lockhart agreed. I was planning as much. Now that we're here, we can't delay just because we're injured. Go ahead. The three got ready quickly. They donned their spacesuits, loaded the larger rocket plane with equipment, arms, and plenty of extra fuel. Just before they left, Lockhart gave them a word of caution. Do not attempt to communicate with the Magellan by radio. If Pluto is the Sun Tapper's whole world, you may find yourselves surrounded by enemies and overheard. Don't reveal our existence or position. If you have to talk to us, do not expect a reply unless it's an absolute emergency. Burl strapped himself into his seat within the rocket plane and glanced through the thick window. Below them was a world the size of Earth, a world which, if it had air and warmth, could most nearly be Earth's twin of all the planets in the system. This rocket plane had touched on the hot surface of Mercury, the first planet. In a little while it would set down on the frigid surface of the last planet. They had come a long way. End of chapter 16 Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks.com